Our next speaker is Jason Dodier. Jason is a co-founder and chief commercial officer at Grain Ecosystem, which is a venture-backed company spun out of Schneider, Schneider Electric for the purpose of helping generate high-quality carbon removal offset supply. The company's chief focus is supporting project developers in sequestering as much carbon as possible, leveraging digitization and transparency to ultimately bring together funding and stakeholders to accelerate these projects with an emphasis on biochar. Before co-founding Grain, Jason spent 10 plus years at Schneider Electric in roles including operations, business development, marketing, and sales management based in the US, France, and the Middle East. He is currently in New York City where he initially helped spearhead JFK's new Terminal One microgrid, which will become the largest rooftop terminal solar array in the United States. Welcome, Jason. Well, it's great to be back again at the Wall Street Green Summit. I could say that part of the magic of this event, not just as the speakers we've seen earlier, the diversity and the dynamicism of thought, but it's also what happens after this event. Because I could tell you after last year's event, some of the people that I was fortunate enough to meet and network with, we were able to come together and have some real positive impact in the form of partnerships, other engagements and dynamic all over the world. So, uh, and that's one of the things, uh, one of the reasons I, I don't mind and I like going later in the day is because you can reflect on some of the thoughts and inputs from the other leaders that are in the room here. Uh, if I think about this slide and we've, we've beat this one up pretty bad throughout the day in terms of the current mandates and what we need to do to get to one and a half degrees. Uh, as my friend Pooja said earlier, I mean, we are at 90% of the allocated carbon budget. When you hear the term carbon budget, that essentially means we have a 67% probability of not going past one and a half degrees Celsius. Uh, sadly, right, we are at risk of the next 10% in the next three years, essentially. So over allocating and going past that. Again, Pooja alluded to some of those facts earlier. We are running the most dangerous experiment in history here, right? To see how much carbon dioxide could really be held in our environment. And ultimately, that can only result in some serious catastrophes, which we have started to discuss and allude to that have affected a lot of people personally. The other thing for me, and, and this kind of goes back to the first speaker today, you know, I spent a number of years living in the Middle East. Uh, I was very fortunate to be part of Schneider Electric at that time. And I was part of a group that stood up our Planet and Society Barometer and our Access to Energy program. So I got to travel all over the Middle East, uh, Africa, India, and looked at these communities, right? So when you think about what Nikita said, we still have 300 million people without access to a light bulb. Uh, that's powerful stuff, right? And, and it's up to all of us in the room today to figure out how we come together. And that's why speed and scale, that's why I, I believe inherently in the work that we're doing at Grain and, and many of these other innovative startups and companies out here need to come together to be able to drive the future forward. One of the things I witnessed in my time uh, at Schneider was working on energy efficiency measures, right? So today our projections are that we need to cut about 43% of emissions in the next decade to continue to stay on path and, and have an impact. But what I started to see in my discussions, particularly when I was working on microgrid projects, uh, is that there was a big miss in terms of removal projects. So I started to look at the project finance, the capital being allocated to microgrids and other types of avoidance projects. And we realized we need to do more from an impact perspective. And, and when you think about removals, you've heard some of the terminology today, but basically you've got biological removals, soil amendment, planting trees, and then technological removals, right? So some of the things that have just been all over different news media outlets, direct air capture uh, has been one of them at the forefront. Uh, you look at leveraging machines, mechanical energy to either leverage ground storage or take carbon out of the atmosphere today. So that was one of the, the elements and the core thesis behind grain was how do we help drive projects that are focused on carbon removals? And, you know, when you look at the space, I think there was a gentleman that asked a question about biochar earlier, uh, and a few folks in the back I heard talking about different CDR technologies. If you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time, 
right? So uh, it's important that we look at the mindset shift, right? Because we have to shape the mindset. And part of it is understanding, well, what is there today? I talked to a lot of my colleagues. I've been fortunate to speak at a lot of events all over the world over the last decade. And you got to put things in perspective. Uh, based on the la latest data and intel that we've kind of seen in the market around pre-purchases, well, the good news is pre-purchase of, of carbon offsets are increasing. That's a plus, uh, but not near at the scale that we need. And plus, when you look at pre-purchases and you look at removals, you have to consider delivery, which I'm going to go into a little bit more in detail. But these are some of the main elements of CDR. You can see I don't have afforestation or reforest reforestation on here because I want to hone in on some of these methods that need a little bit more thought and dialogue uh, and intel around. But you can see here in 2022, we've got removal purchase tons just shy, shy of 600,000 um, and deliveries a paltry 37,000. But we're going to talk about some ways uh, that we can improve here. So movements are typically built by thousands of individuals, but sometimes it's a small few that really get the flywheel going. And I want to call out some of these companies. I've been, again, fortunate to sit and talk to leaders with, within many of these businesses to discuss scope one to scope three, in setting, right, different technologies to really drive circular economy. How many people in the room have heard the term circular economy? I'm hoping all the hands go up. The question is, when people talk about it, the definition of circular economy and what it does for the communities that you are executing these projects, right? Are you making the communities better? not just in terms of driving down the resources needed to produce outputs, but helping that, whether it's indigenous population. I mean, some of the articles we've read about in the Wall Street Journal recently have been disturbing because you look at the trends, you look at forestry protection, and you realize the people that are doing the work on the ground are getting left out in a big way. Uh, and, that's, and that's concerning. So some of these companies that are on this list are helping us address speed and scale uh, and, and looking at implementing through insetting true circular economy methods to help drive real change across scope one to scope three emissions. And I'm proud to say, you know, one of our initial seed funders, Schneider Electric, who's uh, one of our executives, Guillaume, is here in the room today, uh, is, is really walking the talk and, and taking a leadership role. And we're proud to be part of their CDR strategy going forward to provide and help support high quality permanent removal projects getting put into the value chain uh, in the marketplace. Now let's, let's zero in a little bit more on the impactful carbon market. So back when we were doing our work at Greentown Labs uh, during incubation, we took a look at the market today uh, at the end of 2021. And what we saw was it was about an average price point of about $15 a metric ton, predominantly for afforestation, reforestation, and about 8 million uh, metric tons currently being traded in the marketplace, about $120 uh, million. You'll have to ignore, if you're doing the math, these numbers are off here. So the 381 is a reflection of the, the price point for the CDR technologies that I showed earlier without a forestation reforestation. So basically what we're seeing in the price point today, it's around $18 to $19 a metric ton blended. Obviously, there's a few projects that make up the bulk, which is some of the direct air capture projects that are in the marketplace today. A 1.5 here in the Permian Basin. Uh, sub, it's a subset of Occidental Petroleum's uh, venture business. There, there's a pre-purchase commitment there for 100,000 metric tons of CO2 a year over four years. Uh, that, that skews the number a little bit, but we're around about an 80% year over year jump at about 226 million. Uh, base case scenario of 500 million metric tons by 2030, which we absolutely need to get close and exceed past puts the marketplace around a $70 billion market. If you look at a blended cost of about $139 a metric ton across all of these methodologies. Um, but if you've read one of my favorite books, Speed and Scale by John Dewar, he's certainly projecting we need to be around four gigatons uh, around the 2030 timeline. And that brings us up to about $560 billion marketplace. So there's a lot going on. That's why I really enjoyed uh, Mike's presentation as well, kind of talking a little bit about the capital piece, because as you'll see momentarily, and this is perfect, the, back, the backdrop, Peter, you timed that, because the ambulance uh, is sounding because we've got a lot of dead bodies here. That's the red color. You know, We talked to over 120 project developers all over the world. 
during incubation, I personally flew out and met with some of these, uh, some of these firms, some of these businesses and farmers, and many of them die or go on life support because it's because of the process and the different elements of the process and the transparency needed. Yes, there's a lot of demand, right? And we saw that at Schneider Electric, you know, in our sustainability business, servicing our customers and they want high quality supply. So that's one of the things that Brain is on a mission to do. Uh, and if you look at the market today, you've got about 22 verticals, 300 plus companies that are out there doing everything from brokers, exchanges, traders, developers, registries, governance, uh, not to mention if you were at Climate Week here in New York City in September. I mean, the list, every time I go to an event, there's more three-letter acronyms and five letters and seven letters. So how do you get there? And I had lunch with Pure Earth recently in DC, just picking their brain on some stuff. And they were telling me a little bit about this before it came out. Uh, and I was happy they did it. But it just, again, lends to the complexity of the marketplace. So what are we trying to do at Grain, ultimately? What we're trying to do is bring a right-sized approach to the market, right? So we talked a little bit about supply side. But what about the demand side? And again, if you look at base carbon and some of the other key players in the space, they discuss about injection of capital. And you've got this concept of catalytic capital, uh, diversified risk capital coming into the marketplace. How do we deploy it? in a manner that can build true speed and scale. And, and that's really, at the end of the day, what, what we're aiming to do is to help these project developers early on to get a grasp of what their options might be and where are the best places to go to look for capital. Now, when we were testing our hypothesis and thesis around carbon dioxide removal technologies, Initially, biochar stood out for many reasons that we all, you know, many of the people in this room uh, might, might think, right? Especially the circular economy play. A couple of weeks ago, Wall Street Journal, uh, if you saw the article, highlighted biochar in a big way. One of the reasons is because of the nearly 65,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide that have been removed from the atmosphere to date. Um, it's been sequestered using biochar. And if you look at this chart and, and you study it a little bit, you start to see, okay, well, the purchases make sense. You've got a good, good dynamic and split here, but biochar is clearly delivering when it comes to sequestering and actually removing in a timely fashion. And I mean, when you think about biochar as leading the way, right? I looked at the amount of capital that's being allocated to other types of technologies. A microgrid today, right? Two to four megawatts, it's about a million dollars of investment for a microgrid around there, right? Direct air capture, it ranges 10 million plus. You look at the price points, credits are, are, are trading from you know, between 300 to 1,000 metric ton plus. So $100 million invested in biochar could potentially crank out 2 million tons of biochar and 4 million carbon credits. So it's a real pittance to what is in the marketplace today, the amount of capital being deployed. So part of my job and our team's job is to be out there and really raising the bell uh, and the alarm bell in terms of helping to allocate capital to CDR and to biochar in particular. And a fascinating stat I saw from the IPCC recently that said soil carbon management and agriculture projects can reduce 1.8 to 4 gigatons of CO2. And biochar could potentially sequester 2 gigatons per year by 2050. Uh, and the cost range would be anywhere between 30 to 120 metric tons of CO2. Contrast that to direct air capture, which is projected potentially by the year 2100 to be sequestering 10 gigatons a year. But to do that, you would need to use half the electricity that we use today in modern society to power direct air capture. So again, you look at what's happening. It's great to see some of these companies engaging, but we're trying to give them more tools, more access to be able to either pre-purchase offsets or invest directly in these projects. But again, this chart really stood out to me because it further validates that biochar is executing at a high level in terms of the, the rapid amount of time towards delivery and sequestration. So hopefully for the gentleman that asked questions on biochar, uh, this is doing a good job to answer some of those now. Uh, so rounding out. So again, coming full circle here and back, back to grain because we have a, a big month ahead. We've certainly had a big year kind of talking to different people all over the world and project developers. Our goal is really focused on these first four pillars, right? Helping with opportunity identification, 
feasibility study, right? You see there's a lot of methodologies in the marketplace today. Uh, the big ones for us, Vera, Pure Earth, Climate Action Reserve, these are the ones that have biochar methodologies in place. And we're agnostic. We're trying to help the project developer to understand what is the best methodology for them to leverage and take advantage of. And then we do the greenhouse gas calculations uh, to, the best, to the best of our ability, right? We've, we've digitized that process. And then we support with understanding what are the best mechanisms to go pre present to investors that could inject capital. Is it a mix of pre-purchase, uh, other forms of debt, USDA-backed loans? There's a lot of angles potentially, uh, and you want to make sure that you're able to build scale, not give up too much equity, but also we want to avoid the tragedy of the commons situation. Everybody's waiting around for prices to drop. You know, part of the reason I said earlier that it takes a few to make a market. If you look at what Frontier Fund and Schneider and others are doing, they're making these investments now, knowing that there's going to be some lost capital. However, they're going to allow for the acceleration. They're going to get, they're going to get a best look at some of these opportunities. So Grain is trying to do that and bring it to the point where a firm like a South Pole uh, or other project developer can help with the registration, certification, third-party verification, and the flywheel continues from there. And as you can see, as I alluded to, we sit in the middle with the project developer and help support them across this stack to understand and get a feel uh, for what, what they may be up against and how to make sure they've got something. And a lot of them were spending time and money and realized there was nothing really there. So we want to help with that as well, uh, to right size and understand what's happening and not let perfection be the enemy of the good. That's, I keep hearing that at conferences, and I want to just reiterate that point. And that's one of the reasons we, we founded Grain, to move a little bit faster and uh, let things break and learn as we continue to go. So coming full circle here, right? We are going to be launching live at the North America Carbon World Conference next week. Uh, again, this is, this is some screenshots and snapshot, but essentially eligibility, estimation, profitability, and an output that you can bring to your investors all in one place. So we look forward to seeing you there. If you're going to be there, we're going to have a pre-event workshop we're going to host with South Pole. And then at our booth, we're actually going to do live end-to-end uh, -end demos with prospective uh, project developers. And just, you know, just to close out, I mean, we've been extremely active. Uh, as I said, one of the highlights is being here, being present with Wall Street Green Summit. Again, I can't thank Peter and his team enough for, for having us here. But don't hesitate to reach out and uh, feel free to scan this QR code. Let us know how you want to engage, certainly if you want the slides want a demo, if you want to dive deeper into the, to the product itself, I'm always available and willing to support. And again, I thank everybody. And hopefully we have a couple minutes for some questions. Thank you, Jason. So I'm going to talk in a little bit about specifically soil organic carbon credits and agricultural opportunities. I've struggled to get my head around biochar. I'm hoping that you can help me understand because the way I understand it, you, you put biochar in the soil and you sequester more carbon in the soil. That's the landowner's carbon credit. Um, similarly with livestock, you, you, you uh, put, put a little biochar in the feed um, and the methane is allegedly reduced. So again, that's a livestock credit. Where is the biochar opportunity? Do you see what I'm asking? Like, where's the biochar opportunity? Yeah, and, and one thing too, I brought a number of friends with me that are doing biochar projects. They're here in the room and I'll make sure that uh, you, you get a chance to talk to them because they're very hands-on. But, but it's a couple of things, right? And, and one of the biggest elements in the whole process, first and foremost, is the technology risk, right? Because I've met with a lot of different stakeholders. You've got, you essentially have feedstock, right? There's different types of feedstock to determine your output, to determine the stability ratios. So the feedstock, the pre-conversion, and the technology are all critical drivers to determine what that output actually is, right? What the measurability is, how long it's going to be sequestered in the soil. And one of the things I've still struggled with, and this is why we need help of some of the bigger companies that you saw on that slide, is to help put capital up and invest to scale out these technologies to help do some of the things you're, you're saying. Because I've also, at the beginning, been one of the people that's been asking some of the tough questions. At first, I was, you know, Terra Preta has been around for thousands of years. Clearly, in the Amazon, it works. Uh, we know it's we know it's a critical component. But to your point, right? Uh, when you think about risk, you've got you've got permanence, which is critical. You've got reversal risk. Uh, you've got stuff production risk. So these are the things you'll see more insurance based products as well. I think coming out to help address some of these points. 
But at the end of the day, we've seen some real tangible projects. I've worked and talked to the team at Wakefield Biochar. I'm hoping to go out and check out some of their actual, you know, the products and projects they've developed to get a better ha better handle on it. But these are going to be the big questions coming up: is the risk components going into going into these projects from feedstock, pre-conversion, post-conversion, and then execution and stability, you know, ratios and tests. Because there's a lot of players and components that go into the the overall flywheel that makes a biochar project tick. So, well, the, the biochar credit itself is essentially based on the amount of, so when you do the laboratory testing and you term, determine the stability ratios, right? You determine, as I said earlier, when you do the greenhouse gas calculations, you determine, we make an estimate of what the sequestration rate, rate may be, and then map that to the number of offsets potentially eligible for the year, right? If you've got a certain amount of switchgrass coming in, you look at what the output potentially is in terms of sequestration, and then you could you could essentially say, hey, this is how many offsets the project would be eligible for. And then there's a third party validation arm that comes in, laboratory testing that happens to validate that calculation, and that's how many offsets based on the Vera or Prioroth methodology that you'd be eligible for. It's yeah, it's a soil credit. Uh, hi, Stephen Johnson with uh, Illinois Clean Fuels. We're developing a SAF project paired with CCS, and a small subset of that is a bunch of high-quality removal credits. Uh, I wanted to get your sense of where things are in terms of market depth and duration around these. Obviously, we're in an emerging space here, but when you're talking to infrastructure scale project finance lenders, they tend to be very humorless uh, <laughs> about uh, what is that actually going to be worth and how long can you sell it out into the future for? Uh, so if you could speak to what you're seeing sort of depth and duration wise in terms of the ability to sell stuff forward for something that say has a four-year development cycle to implement. It's a, it's, it's a big question. Obviously being here in New York City, that's been a lot of the dialogues I've been having with different types of investors. Uh, because if you think about what we were doing with energy as a service, it was a lot of joint ventures between technology companies, private equity companies coming together, uh, looking at looking at deal flow and figuring out, all right, how do you create and put these structures in place, ESA agreements uh, to, to pay back the project and earn the return structure. In the case of these projects, right, typically what I've seen, there's seven year vintages with opportunities to continue adding on seven and not you know, 14, 21 years. The, the biggest items that the investors that I've talked to or want to look at, first and foremost, as I mentioned earlier, that's why it was a good opportunity to highlight it, was the technology risk is a, is a major concern, right? A lot of the players in the market are looking to develop their own proprietary uh, solutions, which is not a bad thing. We need that. But to be able to test and prove the outputs, et cetera, for the stability ratios is critical to driving carbon offsets, which is a major part of the revenue. The other piece is, well, what are the other components that you could potentially leverage as you think about the collar that you would put around the carbon offsets themselves? What are the other revenue streams? Can I get access to potentially those other, other revenue streams? Um, people are looking a lot at letters of credit uh, to tie to USDA back, back loans, uh, the pre-purchase piece, right? One of the reasons the bigger players are critical, if, if you go to an investor and say, hey, I've already got company X that's committed to 20% of the pre-purchase of offsets, that's going to de-risk the deal a little bit more. So I think you're starting to see a willingness of different players to come into the marketplace uh, to look at tactically investing in these projects. But we, ha we have to do a lot more of them, improve them out in order to get people to feel comfortable and confident uh, in terms of the investment nature of, of the business. But that's, again, that's part of why we're all here uh, is, to, is to drive that forward and get a, a small portion of these portfolios looking at CDRs and, and essentially sleeving them together into 10 projects versus these one-off one to $5 million projects. So that's how you can build some more scope and scale. Thanks so much, Jason. Thank you.